Morning, everybody. Please do sit down. Let me ask you to reach for a Bible and to turn to page 1021, page 1021, where, as Maddie says, you'll find 1 John, this new series we're beginning today. If I've not seen you yet this year, uh, I think this is the final time I'm going to say Happy New Year to anybody, but a very Happy New Year to you. Great to have you uh, back with us or with us for the very first time. If you are new, we'd love you to make yourself known to us. Um, for lots of reasons that we'll hear about from God's word this morning. It's important that we're connected with one another as well as with God. And therefore, um, I very much hope we'll get to know you much better in the weeks to come. Let me lead us in prayer as we turn to 1 John. We thank you again for the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the written word of the scriptures. And we pray that by the power of uh, your spirit, Heavenly Father, you would give us understanding of your word. But much more than that, that you would draw us to your son, to you indeed, that we might have life in you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're just going to read um, 1 John chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. The Apostle John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. As ever, I would love you to keep that open in front of you. There's also an outline on the back of the notice sheet that may be of some use to you. But the grand theme of 1 John is eternal life and where to find it, eternal life and where to find it. And I'm uh, guessing, hoping, we won't have to work too hard over the next few weeks to try and work out why that is so important a theme. Um, For as long as we've been on earth, humans have hunted for, lusted after the elixir of life or the fountain of perpetual youth or Harry Potter's philosopher's stone that would enable the holder to cheat death and to live forever. Even this week, there was another headline on the news. Scientists have discovered something that may possibly help slow down the aging process. And everybody gets very excited because for as long as we've been around, we've wanted to live forever. But when the the Bible speaks about eternal life, the thing that it gets most excited about and is most attractive about it is not so much the duration of it as the quality of it. Here's some of the ways that Jesus describes it himself. He speaks of a, a satisfaction that is so deep in our soul that we will never hunger or thirst again. He talks about coming to give us an abundance of life in all of its fullness. He talks about no longer walking in darkness, but having the light of life. He talks about never having to face God as our judge, not being condemned for our wrongs because we have crossed over from death to life. He talks about giving us victory over death and over evil. And he talks, too, about us participating in a family, his family, that is marked by truth and peace and light and love. And in its essence, and the the location of all of those wonderful blessings, eternal life is a living and intimate and secure relationship with God himself. Jesus said famously, I am the life. And here in 1 John, we'll read, he, Jesus, is the true God and eternal life. So we're talking about a a gift of being so closely connected to the eternal God himself, the, the God of life and of love, that we get to share in his life and to experience his unfiltered love now 
and forevermore. And that is the offer that God makes to the world in Jesus Christ. Um, just, we all know though, that it's not an automatic thing. There's the, the world of difference, isn't there, between standing on the outside, looking at something that's attractive and wonderful, or immersing yourself in it and experiencing it for yourself. The easy illustration would be a hot tub. We were on holiday once, went to a gym that had a, an outdoor hot tub with amazing views over a beautiful lake. And when we were there, the weather was freezing. So you could see your own breath on the one hand and the steam rising off the hot tub on the other. And it looked incredible, but obviously you only feel the benefit if you get inside it. Maybe a better illustration would be a group of friends or a family. And the family is full of a love that is incredibly attractive. But it would only be if they invite you in to be a part of their family that you would get to experience all of that love for yourself. Well, now think of God. God is light. God is life. God is love. And he invites us to share in his life and to walk in his life, in his light, and to experience his unfiltered love forevermore. That's where we're heading this semester. And you'll see on the sheet, we've got three points this morning about eternal life. This is really John's prologue. It sets up loads of the themes that we're going to meet as we go through the semester. But the first big point is that eternal life is revealed in Christ. It's revealed in Christ. And it's a funny start to a letter, isn't it? Did you notice that? It doesn't say anything about who the letter's from or to. It just jumps in with this long sentence that piles up loads of details about eternal life. Let me just read it again from verse one. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So you'll see the movement, the eternal life started hidden with the Father in heaven, but was then revealed or made manifest on earth in Christ. Um, to follow that through, the opening words are a deliberate echo of the start of John that we read earlier. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The, the subject is the eternal Word. This is the, the self-expression of God. This is the divine Son, the one through whom and for whom all things were made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And John would write, we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. He was full of grace and truth. So I know we're into January, but we're back to Christmas, aren't we? This is the wonder of the incarnation, the life of God on earth, the, the greatest miracle of all. It's been called the creator on a state visit to his creation, the eternal entering time, the life of God coming to earth to give death-bound people like us the chance to be reborn. And I love this word manifest in verse 2. See, it brackets verse 2. It speaks of God's determination to make his life known and available to the world. So many have this sense of God as being unknown and unknowable. Um, they think God's like some reclusive celebrity who enjoys sitting locked away in his house behind the stars and he's untouched by the trials of life and he's untouchable to mere mortals like us or as though he's playing some cosmic game of hide and seek and he only peeks his head out on special occasions to a few super lucky people. This gives the, the lie to that. It reminds us that the God who is there is not hiding. He is not reluctant to share his life with us. He's chosen to make it manifest in his son, the Lord Jesus. It's even more incredible when you think about the way that we've treated God. Because we are not natural lovers of God. Jesus said, this is the judgment. Light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Um, that verse always makes me think of 
rats. And you know how, I'm sorry to bring them up. I don't think there are any in here, but you might just want to kind of check under your, your chair at some point. And not really, you don't have to do that. You're fine. You're safe uh, with us, I promise. But in the darkness, rats are as, as happy as Larry, aren't they? But then you turn on the light and they hate it so much, I've no idea why, that they scurry into the corners to try and hide from the brightness. And God is light. He's the source of life. He's perfect in all of his ways. You'd think it would be the most natural thing in the world for us to want to revel in his light and to enjoy him. But we choose instead to push him away and to scurry into the the darkness of a life without him. I realize it's not a very flattering comparison, but we all do it like spiritual rats. God would have every right to turn his back on us, to banish us from his light forever. But here we see that the God who is the God of steadfast love chose instead to make his life manifest, to reveal it plainly in the person of his son, to offer us the chance to share in his life forever. Brings us to our second point this morning, eternal life revealed in Christ and then proclaimed by the apostles. This is crucial. It might feel a bit remote, but let me try and explain why it's central. If all God had done was to reveal his life at one particular moment in history, it would have worked brilliantly for those who are in the right place at the right time. But for anyone born 2,000 years later, we would be up a creek. But in his great kindness... God did much more than just reveal it at one particular place. Instead, through the apostles, he ensured that all people in every place, at every stage of history, with a Bible in their hand, would have the ability, access to the life that was made manifest in Jesus. As I read the verses again, look out for the language of sense perception in, from verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. We have seen it and testify it and proclaim to you the eternal life. So there's no taste or smell, but the other three senses are there. We've seen it. We've heard it. We've touched him with our hands. And the we in these verses is not all believers I've never touched Jesus. It's the apostles in particular. And John is thinking especially of the resurrection. There's another deliberate echo in the wording, not from the the start of John's gospel this time, but from the end. You may remember that um, doubting Thomas, as he's called, wasn't there the first time that Jesus appeared to the other disciples. They said to him, we've seen the Lord, but he wasn't having any of it. He said, unless I see in his hands the mark of my nails and of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, he was there when Jesus appeared again. And Jesus said to him, go on, Thomas, do it. Put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And with the the truth, with the life of God staring him in the face like that, Thomas was a changed man. He could doubt no more and said, my Lord and my God. And now at the start of his letter, John says to his readers, when we apostles are preaching to you about eternal life, we're not talking about a, a private experience of the divine that we had in a cave. We're not talking about a, a personal opinion we dreamt up in a seminar. We're talking about public, verifiable history. The life of God came from heaven to earth. And we saw his works. And we heard his words. And we touched his risen body. And he is the one that we proclaim to you. And as I said, this is a a crucial foundation stone for everything that John's going to say in the letter, just to give you the the context of where we're going, we'll see that um, some key people had departed from the church that John was writing to. Um, They'd looked to all the world like they were friends of Jesus, but now they'd gone 
And their departure was really unsettling for the people who stayed behind. And what was making it even worse is what these departers were teaching. Um, some of the buzzwords we'll meet are things like knowledge and anointing and victory or overcoming. And the departers were claiming that they had such a deep knowledge of God, far better than anyone else's, and that they'd received such a rich anointing from God and been given such victory by God that they were now able to overcome sin completely in their lives. And these ordinary believers who were left behind were terrified, genuinely worried. Does that mean that we don't know God at all? Does that mean that we don't have eternal life? And so John's writing to reassure them. Uh, if you flick on to chapter 5, verse 13, you'll see that he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Chapter 5, verse 13 I'm writing, so that you may know that you have eternal life. I don't want you to be in any doubt about it. I don't want you to be unsettled. I don't want you to be insecure. I want you to know. That's the, the backdrop to the letter. And it, it shows, I think, why John's introduction is so on point. It's his way of reminding, reassuring his readers that the, the message, the gospel that they'd heard and believed isn't wobbly or shaky or ineffective. It's not idle myth or speculation. It's not the product of Chinese whispers. But those of us who are Christians have pinned our eternal destiny on the reliability and authenticity of the, the gospel promises that were proclaimed by the apostles and recorded in the scriptures. And now John is saying, you can know that you have eternal life. Because the word of life that we proclaim to you is rock solid truth. God manifests his life in Jesus. We've witnessed it. And he is the one that we're proclaiming to you. Just to press on the significance of this for a, a second. Um, I heard a preacher say recently that the gift of the apostles, he described it, one of the kindest things that God has ever done for us. Uh, that sounded a bit weird uh, when I first heard it, but I think when you stop and think about it, you see what he's saying. And I've referred to the apostles before as being a bridge between Jesus and us. They are the, the means by which the, the eternal life that was made manifest in Jesus is then transported and delivered and offered to the whole world. Think for a, a moment where we would be without them. Uh, no exaggeration to say that without them, the, the words and works of Jesus would have died with him. We would have no reliable record of everything that Jesus said and did. We would have no chance of a relationship with him. No access to the eternal life that he died to win. Or again, imagine if the apostles all disagreed with each other. If Peter said one thing about Jesus and John something different and Paul different, we'd never know who to believe. We would never have confidence that we were relating to the real Jesus, that we really have eternal life. So it is indeed a great kindness of God that when Jesus came into the world to manifest the life of God, he also appointed the apostles to witness everything that he said and did, and then empowered by the Holy Spirit to proclaim him faithfully, authoritatively to the world. It means that as we listen to their words, we're encountering and experiencing the very life of God himself. And that's our third point this morning. Eternal life is enjoyed by all who believe. Uh, and I want to Mull, uh, sort of mull on this with you individually and corporately. Individually first, verse three, that which we've seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be complete. See how the, the, the movement is completed um, the Father has life in himself. He chooses to make that life manifest in his son, Jesus. That's witnessed by the apostles and then proclaimed to us so that we can have fellowship with the apostles 
who in turn have fellowship with the Son and with the Father. So it goes, Father, Son, Apostles, us, Apostles, Son, and Father. And John's ultimate desire for his readers is that we would experience, we would enjoy, we would share in the life of God himself as we have fellowship with the Father and the Son. That's what will make John's own joy complete. He loves this church deeply. He wants them to know God. He wants them to know that they know God. That's the destination. If I can put it like this, John is is just the bridge. But if you don't cross the bridge, you can't reach the destination. And that's why John is so anxious that his friends, some of them, might be seduced into drifting away from the gospel as taught by the apostles and to start believing something else. It's because he longs for them to share in the life of God forevermore. Remember then how that life is described in in John, as I mentioned it earlier. A satisfaction so deep in our souls that we never hunger or thirst again. An abundance of life. Walking in the light of life. Crossing from death to life. No condemnation. All of it in this living, intimate, secure relationship with the eternal Father and his Son, Jesus. Sharing in his life walking in his light, experiencing his unfiltered love together forevermore. And I do want to underline that that is how high the stakes are. If you're someone who's in investigating the Christian faith, you're not sure what you make of it. Can you see the, the magnitude of what is on offer in Jesus and eternal life with him? Occasionally I meet people who are a bit unbothered about Jesus They don't object very much to him or anything he says, but they're not all that bothered about him either. Someone said to me, I just don't see the big deal. Why do we need to bother with Jesus? Why can't we just get on and and be nice to people? Jesus could never be an optional extra, though. He is the true God. He is eternal life. And it goes without saying, I hope that we would love you to experience that life for yourself if you don't yet know it. It's only ever a prayer away. We'd love to chat to you about it. We'd love you to come on that Hope Explored course. If you're ready to receive Jesus as Lord, you could do it today. And that eternal life would be yours already. Many of us are Christians already, of course. We've received the apostles' testimony about Jesus, even if we've never thought of it in those terms before. We've read the Bible and understood it to be true. We've accepted its message. We need to, we're not being offered eternal life this morning, if I put it like that. We're being reminded and reassured that we already have it. Later in the letter, whoever has the Son has life. And I want to underline that whatever we've got going on at the moment, however big your trials and struggles, whatever you're facing, Specifically, any pain that you've ever felt when individuals or churches or denominations have departed from the truth of the gospel. God wants us to be reassured, to know that we have eternal life if we're continuing to believe what the apostles taught. It's a life that has begun now. Anyone and everyone who believes the good news of the gospel, as it was preached by the apostles, as it's written in the Bible, has fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is much bigger than any individual church or denomination. Whoever has the apostolic gospel and has received Jesus has fellowship with the Father and with his Son. We already walk in his light. We already share in his life. Nothing will ever separate us from his love, not even death itself. That's going to have all sorts of implications for the way that we live. And we'll think about them as we go through the letter. But we want to be praying that this confidence and conviction grows in us this semester. That's the big work that this portion of God's word is here to do in our church family. It's to grow our confidence that if we've got Jesus in the Gospels, We have eternal life. 
But as we close, I want to remind us that these verses weren't written to an individual Christian, but to a church. Um, So if you glance down at verses two and three again, all of the yous are plural. And eternal life is not something that we possess individually or enjoy privately, but something that is experienced inevitably and unavoidably in the community of God's people. I've told many of you before, this is a truth that was seriously underdeveloped in my own Christian life for far too long. When I was first a Christian, I knew I had a relationship with God. I knew my mates had a relationship with God. I knew I went to church, but I never somehow joined the dots between those. But if I know God as my father, and if you know God as your father, And if that's true for anyone and everyone who believes in Jesus, that has to transform the way that we think about church. It's no longer an event that we attend, but a family to whom we belong. It's a radical idea if we let it sink in. But those who follow Jesus are made by God into a family that is united in the truth of the gospel that we believe. That's the source of our unity but will be marked by truth and peace and light and love. So there would be no place for trying to do this Christian thing on our own. There would be no place for thinking that we don't belong in church because our face doesn't fit with the wrong kind of person, the wrong background, whatever. It would be wrong to think that we, we wouldn't be accepted. It would be wrong to think that we've got nothing to contribute. Conversely, it would be wrong to think that we're slightly above and too good for other people around us. It'd be wrong to think that we don't need anyone else to flourish in the Christian life because God has made us a family. Later in the letter again, everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. So that just as it's not possible to love God and be unbothered about Jesus, Neither is it possible to love God and be unbothered about his people, the church. And John wants us to enjoy the eternal life that Christ died on the cross to win for us. He wants us to know that if we believed in Jesus, we have a living and secure relationship with the eternal father and with his son, Jesus. We share in his life. We walk in his light and we experience his unfiltered love together in the community of his people. Now, imperfectly, and one day gathered around the throne of Jesus, wonderfully, perfectly. Let's pray together. Our Father, we want to thank you that you are not hiding We want to thank you that you're not keeping your life to yourself, but that you made it manifest in your son, the Lord Jesus. You ensured that the apostles were there to witness him and to proclaim him faithfully. And we thank you that now as we receive words written 2,000 years ago, we are drawn into fellowship, not only with the apostles, but with your son, the Lord Jesus, indeed with you as our father. Thank you that whoever receives the Lord Jesus is given the right to become a child of God. And we want to thank you, therefore, that we know you, that we share in your life, that we walk in your light, that we experience your love. And we want to pray that you would help us to be secure and confident in the life that is ours in Jesus. We pray that you'd help us to live in the light of it. And we pray that you'd help us rightly to value the apostolic words and the community of your people in the church, that we would be marked by love for your son, for your word, and for your children. And we pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh